Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to my top 20 movies and TV shows of 2023. I think most people can agree that 2023 was not a highlight moment in the human race. But one thing I will admit, it was certainly a turning point in regards to the industry of movies and TV shows. Not to sound like a broken record, but I think a lot of people can agree that the last, say, five to six years have been riddled with cynicism about the future of cinema, with the rise in sequels, franchises, and just kind of dependency on recognised properties. There's been a fear that the art of cinema has declined in quality and that we are seeing the rise to a new era in submitting to our corporate overlords instead of artistic integrity. Which I think is more of a case of the Hollywood system than cinema itself. But I think definitely 2023 was an interesting year where we were starting to see kind of the end to a lot of this kind of franchise dependency. Obviously we saw the success of the Barbenheimer cultural phenomenon, which saw two totally original movies directed by auteur directors performing the most successfully of the year. And seeing the good old faithful Marvel and Disney remakes and DC movies actually performing some of the weakest. I definitely think a sign that people were sick and tired of the same old and actually want to see something new in the cinemas. In my opinion, it's a great sign of things to come and reflecting back on the year to making this list, I will admit for 2023, it was really hard to come up with just top 20. There was a lot of strong contenders. So yeah, just to say that I have not seen these following movies, just in case you're wondering why it may not be on this list. And yeah, so here we go. Number 20. The Boy and the Heron, also known as How Do You Live? Japanese animator Hayao Miyazaki's final movie? This has been said a couple of times, so I'll believe it when I see it. But hey, I'm not complaining. It's always good to see another Stallman in his work. So I will admit, when I first came out of this, I was a little underwhelmed. I felt more like a hodgepodge of his entire filmography placed into one kind of incoherent film, something that I do still feel the film suffers from. That being said, the more I've been reflecting on it over the last couple of months, the more I'm starting to appreciate a lot of what it actually did. Firstly, it is one of the most beautiful looking animated films that I saw of last year, but it is also just one of the most creatively rich movies. The creature designs are magnificent to look at, from hauntingly creepy to bizarrely whimsical. One of my favourite moments in the film is with the dying bird that is probably one of the saddest and deepest moments ever written for a Miyazaki movie. This is definitely not a kid's movie, this is definitely one of his darker movies which I really appreciated. It is profound in some of its ideas about creating a better world and ultimately passing on this responsibility to the next generation. I do still feel it's a bit messy as a result, but I think on more reflection I'm starting to piece together what he was trying to get at. I also feel that this is definitely his strongest work since Spirited Away. I haven't been a huge fan of his last three movies I think it's been. If this is indeed his final picture, it's a very fitting conclusion. And I want to thank Miyazaki greatly for the impact that he's had on animation and storytelling in general. It's definitely worth checking out. Number 19. Telemarketers. This is a very short HBO miniseries that came out later stage of last year. It was produced by Benny Safdie. Very fascinating exploration into the American telemarketing, specifically the ones involving raising money for police and firefighters. It's a film that's been developed over the last 20 years by its director, Sam, who actually worked in the telemarketing business, along with his partner in crime, Pat Pespis who's definitely one of the more interesting characters. The documentary series attempts to take a sort of Michael Moore approach to its investigative journalism. I definitely feel the first episode is the strongest as it's the most reflective on the director's experience working within the telemarketing business. It's not the most succinct essay on this topic and I do feel there's much more to go exploring with. That being said, it's a really good start and just because it's so short and it's filled with shocking moments it's definitely worth your time checking out number 18 wes anderson's roll doll series so these were four short films that director wes anderson made for netflix along with his feature length entry 
Asteroid City, which I have not seen. Now, I will admit I'm not a huge Wes Anderson fan. I do feel his style has become rather annoying, and as a result, I think a lot of them have just been riding the wave of the success of the Grand Budapest Hotel. That being said, this is definitely his strongest work. Firstly, it's based off Roald Dahl, who's just an incredibly wonderful children's author, and the style of Wes Anderson just fits it perfectly. Obviously, it worked really well with the stop-motion animation, Fantastic Mr. Fox, and yeah, it works really well here. I'll just quickly go through the four short films in rank of the one I preferred the most, to the one I least enjoyed. The best one in my opinion is Poison. My second favorite is The Rat Catcher. My third would be The Swan. And yeah, sadly my least favorite would have to be the longest one and the one that Netflix promoted the most, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. Not that it's inherently bad, I just think it has by far the weakest storyline of the four short films. That being said, one thing that all four films have in commonality is the visual flair. These are absolutely stunning short films. Standout performances are from Dev Patel and Ray Fiennes, who all play completely different characters. Benedict Cumberbatch as well gives a fantastic performance in the Poison short film. You can see that everyone involved in these projects had a huge amount of fun and a lot of work went into these films. It's a shame these projects have been kind of pushed to the side comparatively to his theatrical release Asteroid City. I really do think these four short films definitely require your attention. Number 17, Talk To Me. An Aussie entry, woo! And an A24 entry as well. Everyone's right, it's quite good. Especially impressive coming as a feature film debut. Directors are two Adelaide boys who do have a professional past working on the very successful YouTube channel Raka Raka. But there's a difference between doing YouTube shorts and actually making a feature film, and I think for the most part it really is effective. It doesn't rewrite the formula of these type of haunted artifact stories, but it adds in a lot of interesting commentary on addiction, peer pressure, and the Snapchat TikTok generation. A lot of horror films have attempted to include commentary on the pitfalls of social media, but it never quite gets it. Talk To Me, on the other hand, does this really well, and it certainly helps when the directors grew up on it and build their careers through it. Plus, I feel it just gets young people, especially Australians. It's definitely not a romanticization of it that you would find in something like Home and Away or Neighbours. It's also just short and sweet and to the point. A lot of horror films I find these days really go overboard and unnecessarily extend its runtime just to reach two hours, but this film knows how to use its length. There are problems with the screenplay, but I feel like that's more to do with feature film debut issues instead of an inherent problem that will affect your enjoyment of the film. I also have to commend the amazing work done on the sound design which really adds a level of tension to the film. From the haunting vocals of the undead to just the crunches of bones and flesh, it's just great stuff. The music is also surprisingly well put together, though I will admit TikTok has ruined my enjoyment of the Edith Piaf remix. still think it's a bop, but it's been overplayed to death. Yeah, overall I'm really happy that an Australian horror film really hit big with people. And just as a reminder how much talent there is in my country. I am kind of cynical about them doing a sequel, but I mean, of course it was always going to happen, especially with the success of it. But whatever. The first entry was really, really good. And yeah, it deserves all the praise it gets. Number 16. They Cloned Tyrone. So this film kind of went under the radar because it came out on the worst weekend imaginable for a movie. It's only the weekend of the biggest cultural event of probably the last five years. <laughs> yes, if there was ever bad luck associated with a film, it's definitely with this one. Which is a goddamn shame because it was really entertaining. This was a Netflix original, essentially their take on the black exploitation genre, and it was really well done. Essentially, a more comedic version of Jordan Peele's Nope, involving a hidden secret society that clones everyone. But instead of trying to explain the absurd concept, the film just runs and has fun with it. The best way I can compare it is if the film Dope and Sorry to Bother You had a child that spoke in jive. What it is, big mama, my mama raised no dummies, I duck a rap. Cut me some slack, yeah. The cast is incredible, with John Boyega being the charming middleman. Tiona Paris being the foul-mouthed but tough-as-nails heroine, 
and Jamie Foxx being a wonderful Tarantino-esque pimp who just steals the show every time he's on screen. It's fun, it's insane, it's gross out at times, and it's also just unpredictable. The jive talk may put people off understanding exactly what's going on, but those who love black exploitation films will be used to it, so it's a definite watch for that crowd. It's just a whole heap of fun that just shouldn't be slept on. Number 15. Killers of the Flower Moon. I've noticed there's been a little bit of hate attributed to this film. People saying it was really disappointing, that the length ruined it. Do I admit that it could have been cut down in length? Yeah, it definitely could have been. That being said, I think of all the films I've watched recently that were three hours and above, it's the one that didn't feel the length. Films like Oppenheimer or even the Batman film from the year before felt like more of a slog. I attribute this to the story being told in Killers being much more interesting from a dramatic level. At least for me, I didn't feel like there was a lot of filler here and the length only helped sell the devious nature of the characters and built on the shocking events. This is Martin Scorsese's take on the western genre, something that he has done before, but here it's almost like Goodfellas but in the Wild West, due to the crime family connections, the big set pieces and family tragedy on display here. One that unfortunately did happen to the Osage nation in real life. I personally don't have an issue with how the Osage nation is depicted here, as the most relatable characters are from this nation. I really do feel Scorsese respectfully shows the tragedy and hatred that was displayed towards this nation. The last shot, or more accurately, sound that plays through the credits especially really nails the tragedy of this story. And I personally was left haunted and speechless. From a production level, I think it's exceptional. It really captures this time of great industrial achievement yet human savagery at the heart of it. I am getting the feeling people were a bit disappointed on this one as it's the new Scorsese film and that always brings with it a high level of anticipation. Maybe it wasn't what people were expecting, I don't know, but I thought it was very good. It was thoroughly entertaining and the huge runtime didn't turn me off. And for that I have respect for it. Number 14. 6.45 Lucky Lotto. Yeah, you're not gonna watch this because of the title, I know. If it wasn't for another entry on this list, I would have to say this would be the funniest film I saw all year. Essentially, the plot is a South Korean soldier on the armistice line loses $6.5 million lottery ticket, which gets flown over to the other side. North Korean soldier picks it up, and it's essentially the battle between South and North Korean soldiers fighting over this lottery ticket. It's an absolutely absurd concept, but it handles it really, really well, and I have to admit, I laughed throughout the entire film. Definitely a mix between the absurdity of Dr. Strangelove and Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Yes, there are a few cheap laughs, yes, including some fart jokes and some really bad CGI at the end of it. But there's so much charm and character, this is easily looked over. It's never predictable, it goes into some absolutely hilarious territory. It's only on the cringe level of humour, but if you don't mind that, you'll be cackling throughout. One joke involving German translators especially tickled me hard, and I was left with a smile on my face for the entire rest of the film. I highly, highly recommend this. It will unfortunately be slept on because of the terrible English title, but it really does deserve your attention. It's got great characters, great sense of humour, and it's also just a breath of fresh air from the usually depressing class warfare films of South Korea. Seriously, great filmmakers, but man are their films depressing. Not this one though, this was an absolute hoot. Number 13, Bo is Afraid. Another three hour epic, but a completely different film from Killers of the Flower Moon. This time being one of the most anxiety inducing movies of the year. Every shot of this film is dripping in the paranoia of this very troubled man, brought to life brilliantly by Joaquin Phoenix. While many can argue that the long runtime was unwarranted, I have to commend Ariasta for putting us through three hours of it. The first 50 minutes of this film are perfect, all taking place in Bo's apartment. I love the fact that it's never really explained whether the crime-filled neighbourhood he lives in really this absurdly dangerous, or if it's just a distorted reality of someone who feels separated from the world and believes everything is out to get him. The scene in the bathtub is genuinely the most anxiety-inducing moment I've had all year. It's great to see Nathan Lane and Parker Posey here as well, there are a few moments that do fall a little bit too far into absurdity, especially around the last half an hour, 
but I enjoyed its dedication to following the saga of a traumatized man who's left with regret and an unquestionable amount of mental trauma. I do have to wonder what possessed A24 to invest so much money into this idea as it really is not accessible for a mainstream audience at all, but I commend them for it. It was a traumatizing time and I'll have it no other way. Number 12. When Evil Lurks. So yeah, sorry talk to me, you are not my favourite horror film of the year. This actually goes to an Argentinian horror film which has been getting a lot of buzz recently because it's really, really good. It's a surprisingly brutal entry into the horror genre this year. I have found that a lot of modern horror films have not really gone to those uncomfortable areas. And for a genre that's meant to shock and disturb you, I feel that's a real problem. You usually can tell when a film starts that certain characters are up for the chop and others are totally off limits. It just gets rid of all kind of suspense and shock. But with this film, yeah, no fucks given whatsoever. And I really appreciated that. Prepare yourself, that's all I'm saying. Once again, it's a very recognisable type of horror with the demonic possession film, but it takes a really unique approach to the concept. It's much darker, with a great level of believability mixed in with some great folklore mythos. It also doesn't let its low budget weigh it down, with all the gore and makeup being pulled off exceptionally well. It's just a really well made horror film that pulls no punches and will leave you deeply disturbed. Number 11. Past Lives. I'm sorry it's this low on this list. I do have a few issues with the film, but I think as a whole I will agree it is a very emotionally poignant film. It's a film that especially hit me hard coming into my late 20s as I start to settle down and go through my own reflection, what I've achieved, but also considering the possibilities that could have been, the paths that I could have gone down, and the people that I have known and lost on the way. It's a film that observes the beauty of these relationships and the healing that comes with letting go. And for that, it's a film that should universally speak for everyone. This is shockingly a feature debut from Celine Song, and you really can't tell here. There is so much authenticity. The last 40 minutes, in my opinion, is one of the most magically intimate moments of the year. The bar scene especially I was truly touched by, with the simplicity of the shots as it purely relies on all the emotional baggage of the characters' performances, what they're going through. The only reason it's a bit lower on my list is I do feel the pacing of the first act is a little off. But that being said, Past Lives is a must see. And now we're coming to the tens. Downwind. So you know how I said past lives was a beautiful representation of humanity? Well, this is the polar opposite. When I say this film is one of the most frightening and traumatizing documentaries I've ever seen, I mean it with every fiber of my being. It's the perfect film to watch right after Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer as it shows the real devastating consequences of the nuclear arms race. And boy, it's frightening stuff. I can attest that after watching it, I went into a two week period of utter cynicism and depression. I'm okay now, thanks for asking, but this documentary had a profound impact on me. This film is a reminder that even if humanity does plunge back into another global conflict, everything should be done to remove any possibility of nuclear devices being used. This shocking documentary spends time with an arrangement of grim stories and perspectives from people affected by the blasts, from the impact it's had on native Indians on their land and and the loss of their tribes, to even Hollywood celebrities like the American legend John Wayne and how his entire film crew of the 1956 film The Conqueror was exposed to a radiation fallout that spread from a 32 kiloton nuclear device. But the most tragic stories have to come from the civilians, a one especially who they had to bury her entire family is just traumatizing to listen to her account. The documentary also goes further into how the US government was hiding this history and the disgraceful compensation package made by Congress to somehow relieve the pain and misery. It's just guaranteed to make your blood boil. All in all, Downwind is an incredibly powerful documentary which sadly has a lot more relevance to the current political climate than we'd like to admit. And I'm sorry, if you had the time to sit through three hours of Oppenheimer, you definitely have the time to, to watch the real story and the real impact of nuclear fallout. Thankfully, it's been released online, so it's available for a lot of streaming services. So please, please check it out. Number nine. Speaking of nuclear fallout, Godzilla Minus One. 
I'm not a huge Godzilla and Kaiju fan. It's not a genre of film that I've gotten into very deeply. Maybe that's why I enjoyed the hell out of Godzilla Minus One, because it solves a problem that I've had with a lot of the modern Godzilla films. For some reason or another, the American movies have been trying to make you relate to their human characters. But the problem is, is they're always as dry as the Sahara Desert. But in Minus One, they actually succeed in making you care. In fact, so much so, I would have been fine with less Godzilla stuff. The characters are just so fantastic and well developed that when they're in danger of being obliterated by Gojira himself, you will actually care. See, it's not that hard, just get good writers in. Firstly, I have to commend the decision to set the film in World War II, as it not only separates it from the last crop of Japanese and American Godzilla films, but also clearly pays close reverence to the original 1964 film. The idea of monster annihilation also fits really well following the damages Japan received from World War II, essentially putting Japan through even further turmoil. It also just proves that this 70-year-old franchise still has fire to it. You just have to get the talent involved. Also, I've noted the monster moments are great too, with jaw-dropping visual effects that put a lot of Marvel movies to shame. What more can I say that the internet hasn't already said? It's a fantastic film and is hands down one of 2023's best. Number 8. The re-release of The Pusher Trilogy. Yes, I'm aware that these films came out over two decades ago, but 2023 saw the remastered re-release of the trilogy that put Nicholas Winding Refn, Kim Bodnia, and Mads Mikkelsen on the map. And it was the first time I got to see them last year and I thoroughly enjoyed them. So a trilogy that was never meant to be one and was essentially stretched out because of financial difficulties that Refn got into after two financial bombs. But boy, you can't tell here, this is up there with one of the most well thought out and complete trilogies ever made. Diving into the deep dark underbelly of the Copenhagen crime world, these three films are a masterclass in character development, world building and building tension. Each film takes the perspective of a different person in the criminal underworld, the first being a drug pusher, the second an addict and the third a king. Pin. Each film is unique in its approach and tells a truly nail-biting story. Personally, my favourite of the films is the second film, with the character of Tommy being such a tragic story of a sore loser who gets out of prison and just keeps making bad life decisions. I can easily see the Safdie brothers taking influence from this film. It's a fantastic trilogy that examines the lives of individuals who are caught in the trap of criminal enterprise. Despite all the glamour attributed to such a lifestyle, it's not one you can easily escape, nor one if you do, unscathed. There's so much more I want to talk about with this trilogy, but I might leave that up to my my upcoming video essay on these films. Essentially I'll just say go out and see them. They really are excellent, the remastering is top notch, it's very much a trilogy that's been slept on. Number 7. Blackberry. The new film from Canadian director Matt Johnson, who made The Dirties, Operation Avalanche, and Nirvana, The Band, The Show. Upon first inspection, Blackberry could be mistaken as an attempt to do another social network film, this time about the rise and fall of the Blackberry phone. Very wordy and it's very stylized, but it quickly differentiates itself from your pro-typical biopic film by making it a mockumentary. I can't see many people being turned off by this film. It's a must-see for anyone who enjoyed The Big Short, but I think even people who aren't a fan of Adam McKay's humour will find this much more satisfying to watch. Firstly, the screenplay is top notch with some of the year's best and funniest lines. Most surprising, however, is the effort from the acting department. Blackberry has probably two of my favourite performances from 2023 with Jay Baritchell and Glenn Howerton. Yes, from It's Always Sunny from Philadelphia. Howerton is perfect as the slimy and fun businessman and Jim Balsall and Baruchel, who gives a career best performance as the Geeky Mike. Shout out also to including YouTuber ProZD and Michael Ironside and Kerry Ellowis in this great cast as well. Blackberry is just such an energetic film that never has a dull moment. Apparently they did release a miniseries version of this film which includes extra footage not included in the theatrical cut, which I'm definitely going to check out. As yeah, I was absolutely floored by this film. Don't assume this is just a clone of Social Network. This is an incredibly fun time that left me laughing my ass off and thrilled me during its dramatic moments. Absolutely love this film. Number six. The Killer. Why so serious? A film that I feel got a bad rap when it first came out. And don't get me wrong, I can sort of understand why it wouldn't fly with some people. The new film from David Fincher, who has just recently renewed his contract with Netflix, 
which I am incredibly happy about as we're going to get more goodies from him. But yeah, I absolutely loved this film. I will agree it is very simplistic in plot. Yes, I would agree the main character's motivations are underdeveloped. And while I would normally have an issue with this, I feel it suits this film for what it's going for. And that's just putting you in the shoes of an uncomfortably cold killer with no remorse. Killer is essentially what David Fincher's adaptation of the hit video game series Hitman would look like. Even the way the different hits are organised in the film is very similar to the way the missions in the video game series are completed. In my opinion, everything here just works. Michael Fassbender delivers his best performance since Steve McQueen's Shame. The cinematography is gorgeous, but that's not a surprise coming from Fincher's movies. The score from Trent Reznor is heart pumping. The action is thrilling, visceral and brutal. Even the way the Smith score is used is forgivable, even though it's become a bit of a cliche in films about psychos. I do wonder how Morrissey feels about that. I've got no idea. <laughs> My only real complaint here is the Tilda Swinton scene is a bit disappointing. It's not entirely her fault as it's the dialogue that kind of lets her down, but most importantly that the film just didn't get a longer cinema release. Most people would have seen it on their computers and that in my opinion just takes away so much of the impact I felt from this riveting movie. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with how enthusiastic I am about this film, but I genuinely love this. I've seen it twice now and I can't wait till my next watch. It's another really fun addition from just such a great director. Okay, stick with me guys. We're in our number five. Beef. Remember Beef came out? I had almost forgotten it came out in 2023. This was uh, Netflix's first collaboration with A24. This is a fantastic Battle of the Wits TV series, a fantastic sense of humour, but also a fantastic level of drama. Two fantastic performances from Steven Yoon and Ali Wong of all people. It's always hard to figure out if a comedian's going to work well in the world of drama, but it's fantastic. If any show you're going to binge watch from last year, it's definitely this one, but I really enjoyed it. I had a blast of a time with it. Number four, The Zone of Interest. This is a truly haunting cinematic experience that I would recommend everyone sit through at least once. Not an easy watch at all, but due to the topic matter, that only seems right. However, what truly makes this film stand out from a lot of the other films depicting this history is this feeling of dread it exudes without ever feeling the need to show any of the grisly details. We're all familiar to what happened in this history, but this film respects that. What it does instead is focus on the life of the instigators and just how normal of a life they led. The House family really lived in a paradise right next to the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. Can I think of a director that could have handled this story as well as Glazer? I'm a huge fan of his work already, as he truly understands visual storytelling and putting you in a very alien and uncomfortable feeling, which this entire film is. Hell, he dedicates the first 10 minutes to just the title card of the film and the haunting music of Mika Levi. It can be seen as pretentious by some, but it is clearly there to evoke a feeling of horror that really helps absorb you into the incoming 90 minutes. I love the visual storytelling of this film. I can say three months after seeing it, images in this film are scarred right into my head. Beautiful images that carry so much emotional weight, but are presented in such a subtle fashion. There's a shot at the end of this film involving a quiet hallway that practically floored me, and I would probably consider it the moment of 2023 that has stuck with me the most. I'll let you see the scene for yourself, but tell me that is not a fucking powerful statement to make. I'm thrilled to see this film was nominated for sound design at the Oscars, because no film deserves it more in my opinion. As a film fan I was genuinely stunned, just the way everyday sounds are utilised, and sometimes even just the absence of it entirely helped create such a sinister mood. It is rather unfortunate that the film was released at such a heated time politically and I feel some of its power will be undermined a little as a result of the October events. I beg you not to ignore this film as a result however as I feel that Glazer is getting at something much more universal and pertinent to the overall condition and problems of humanity and certainly puts into perspective some of the evil that festers and continues in this world even in the comforts of the family home. Evil is not usually moustache twistingly over the top it can be as easy as the simple acceptance of genocide. The Zone of Interest is a haunting film, and you know what? Despite my reservations of it at the time, I'm buying myself a ticket again when it comes out in Australia later this month. It further solidifies my love of Jonathan Glazer as a director, and is in my opinion a truly stunning piece of movie making. Number 3. Sick of Myself 
While I certainly felt uncomfortable watching Zone of Interest, I'm not gonna lie, this Norwegian film wins the race. Obviously a more comedic film, and not one based off tragic real events. Sick of Myself is one of those wonderfully dark comedies that will certainly split audiences. I for one was on board with it the entire way. Essentially a film about narcissism bordering on psychopathic behaviour, this film is a biting satire of the growing trends in self-obsession and wanting to get those 15 minutes of fame no matter what. Director Christopher Bolley actually brought out another film in 2023, the more recognised dream scenario from A24 and starring Nicolas Cage. A film that also touches on similar themes of celebrity, cancel culture, wokeness, narcissism and obsession, but I do find myself drawn more to sick of myself and I think it's just because of how unhinged the humor and its main characters are. There's no beating around the bush here, our main characters are bad people, like very bad. There is no attempt to make them relatable or nice or sympathetic. They are so self-obsessed that it borders on ridiculousness. It skirts into incredibly uncomfortable territory at times, but it never lost me along the way. I was always laughing while also feeling deeply appalled. It is unrelenting in its cruelness that I was reminded very much of the humour of a Neil Laboot film. The screenplay is exceptional here with a wonderful sense of chaotic energy that will just leave people deeply disturbed. It's an outstanding film that definitely got me curious into checking out more from this new agent director. I really can't recommend this film enough. Number 2. El Caraz. I will admit, for a while this was my favourite film of 2023, until it just got beaten in the last couple of weeks of the year, and well, stay tuned for what that film is. But going back to this, Al Caraz is a welcome breath of optimism in a year of great cynicism, a world that is growing ever so divided and split on opinion. Al Caraz was a wonderful reminder of the importance of human compassion, family and tradition. This is the second film from wonderful new talent from Spain, Carla Simon who I will definitely be keeping an eye on after this. The film revolves around a family growing up in a self-titled town whose farming life is interrupted by the sudden threat of eviction to make way for solar panels, which obviously causes a rift in the family and forces each member of the family to work together. This is a film dripping in love and nostalgia that can only come from someone who lives and breathes this culture. While many will go on about some of the great performances from some of our favourite actors this year, you will not find performances as authentic and beautiful as the ones found in El Caraz, and they are all non-professional. Every family member is wonderfully represented in this story. It's a testament to the story that it has time to build up every single one of the family members. From showing the bright spark of youth and innocence of the children playing around, the teenage angst of the eldest daughter accepting her responsibilities as an adult and guiding her siblings along. The eldest son working with his father to establish order in the family while exploring himself through the local techno raves he attends off hours. The unspoken wisdom and presence of the grandfather Rogelio is extraordinary. He barely speaks in the film, yet his facial expressions and the way he carries himself speak volumes of how he tries to remain calm while feeling he has failed his children and grandkids by not putting in writing his ownership of the land. El Caraz is filled with just beautifully authentic moments. From grandmothers arguing over who makes the best tomato paste, the anxious daughter showing her mother the dance routine she's been putting weeks of practice into, to the moment that actually made me bawl my eyes out. The scene where the father, who up to this moment has been a tough, cynical and controlling presence in the family, finally embraces his responsibility as a father and engages in a playful game of tag with his children. Though the inevitable finally happens by the end of the film, it's the journey one goes on in this film that makes it worth it. El Caraz is a wonderful picture that deserves so much more praise and I cannot recommend a more beautiful film this year. Even my number one pick doesn't quite measure up to the emotional power of El Caraz. It's an outstanding film. But it unfortunately got beaten. It was going to be my number one. But I did see something that encapsulates, once again, why I love cinema, why I love going to the movies, and why I think it is one of the strongest artistic mediums. Number one. Four things. Yeah. 
Now I knew immediately once the credits started rolling that this was the one. While I admit I was more emotionally tested by other films, I cannot think of a film that equally earns its place as the golden winner of 2023. This is a film that just absolutely nails every department of filmmaking. From the acting, the phenomenal screenplay, the look of the film, held the title cards separating the chapters of the film are gorgeous to look at. This is a film that has so much character and despite how insane it gets, it owns every moment on screen and just has so much fun with it. It's one of those films like Whiplash or Inside Lewin Davis or Under the Skin that I was just left buzzing afterwards when I came out of the cinema. So I'm going to find really any problem with it. Well, okay, I, I might have one little quibble with poor things. The subplot involving the husband was a little rushed and unnecessary, but it only lasts like 10 minutes and wasn't really a huge stain on the overall enjoyment. It's just a slight quibble that maybe I would have removed if in my perfect version of the film. But apart from that, I, I just cannot think of any problems here at all. This is a film where everyone who worked on this film should be just fucking proud of themselves. This is a classic in the making. The screenplay is phenomenal that tells a fantastically witty tale that explores so many ideas without feeling like it's getting bogged down in the politics. The cinematography is fun and creative and beautiful to look at and it holds one of the best uses of fisheye lens I've ever seen in a film. It just adds so much charm and character to the proceedings of the film. The performances are all brilliant but especially from Emma Stone and Mark Ruffalo, who are genuinely electric together, making for the funniest performances of the year. The music score perfectly captures the insane tone to this film. It's remarkable and it's incredibly catchy. The costume design, production design, this film has just so much replayability. It's an extraordinary piece of cinema. It was literally the last film I saw of 2023. and. Christ, what a great way to end the year. It really does deserve all the praise it's getting. This is definitely going to be in my top 10 films of probably the 2020s. I just had so much fun with it. It's incredibly charming, it's incredibly weird, but there's just so much character, so much detail. It just, oh, I love it so much. And yeah, that's my top 20 films and TV shows of 2023. Thank you so much for sticking around. I really hope I gave some great recommendations. Tell me of any movies that I missed out on. But yeah, i got to say, looking back on 2023, it was a solid year in cinema, and I'm really looking forward to 2024 and what it has to offer. If you liked the video, please remember to like and subscribe to The Current Call, and uh, can't wait to do the next video. Okay, peace.